Good morning. morning. It's great to see you. And I don't mind the coolness (laughs) at all. Somebody said it's cold. I don't think it's that cold. I think it's great. My wife gets gets, uh, cold very easily, and I don't. I I thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, It's amazing how uh, when you marry someone, you find out that they're so different from you in many ways. As you get to know them, they get to know you. But it's a compliment that takes place. And uh, she puts up with me an awful lot, but uh, it's it's been a great experience. So I wanna thank you for the invitation to come here. My name is Steve Hutchison. I've never been here before, and yet I feel close to you for another reason. It was nearly 50 years ago, and that's a long time. I mean, I'm only 51, I'm only kidding. (laughs) What are you laughing at? <laughs> it, was, it was nearly 50 years ago. I was at Eastern Baptist Theological Seminary, which is now Palmer Seminary. Uh, but in my last two years, uh, we, have, we serve in churches, you know, working with the pastors and, and learning the ropes and, and everything else and putting into practice what we have learned. And in my last two years, in 1969 to 71, I was at Calvary Baptist Church in Norristown, right there in Marshall, and across the street was another church called First Baptist Church. And so I got to know some of the people there, but I had a great experience. In fact, it was the pastor of, of Calvary Baptist Church, Paul Eppinger, who years before, um, that was actually maybe a couple years before that, uh, I heard him speak, and I'd always wrestled against, I never wanted to be a pastor. I never wanted to be a part, I loved the Lord, but I didn't, I didn't like the church because they were full of hypocrites. And then someone said, well, you can come. We, we got room for one more, <laughs> you know. Anyway, the bottom line is that I love, the, I love Christ, but I just didn't want to go into the church. I love mathematics. It was easy for me. And I was majoring in math when I went to Eastern Baptist College. But it was during that time uh, that I bumped into Paul at a, at a conference, and when he spoke, it blew me out of the water. And God spoke to me in many ways. It wasn't Paul as much as it was the Lord. And I couldn't believe it that I felt called to church-related ministry. And I thought God had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> I really did. And, uh, and yet, you know, when changes take place in your life, like your pastors going off to another church uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, and you'll be searching for leadership you know, from this point on. But what I found out is that God doesn't make mistakes. He never has made a mistake. And he's not about to make make a mistake with you. And what he has started, what he started a long time ago, back in the 1800s with this church, he's the same today as he was yesterday. And he's going to continue to bless you in many ways. So just don't forget who's in charge. And that's what carried me on. Uh, and I learned a lot, and what I didn't like about the church, it's amazing, I grew to love the church. I love the people. You know, like my wife knows all my hang-ups, but she loves me, <laughs> you know, and I just learned to love the people and, and, and everything else. And so the important thing is just don't forget who's in charge and continue to follow the leading of the Lord. So I want to thank you for the invitation to come here because it brought back a lot of memories, transitional memories, things that took place in my life. And uh, I'm very happy to be here today. So thank you very, very much. Now, if you have your Bibles, please take them and turn with me to the Old Testament. I'm going to read from uh, my Bible, the uh, New International Version. It's probably a scripture passage that many of you have heard before. But it's Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18, and I'll be reading just the first six verses. Listen as I read the scripture. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down, go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I, Jeremiah, went down to the potter's house, and I saw him, the potter, working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, 
Can I not do with you as this potter does, declares the Lord, like clay, like clay in the hand of the potter. So are you in my hand, O house of Israel, like clay in the hand of the potter. So are you in my hand, First Baptist Church of Norristown. Let's take a moment and let's pray. Lord, as we continue in our service, we thank you for your spirit who is here. We thank you for all the people who have gathered. And Lord, we thank you for this time that we can just push everything else aside and focus on you. And as we continue worshiping you, help each and every one of us to be deeply aware that you're with us right now. May our, our ears be open, our hearts, our hearts be wide open and receptive to your spirit as we listen to what you would have us to hear. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart and all the thoughts that are running rampant within me, Lord, may all of these be acceptable in your sight. For I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. There's a story, a story about an American couple who on their 20th wedding 25th wedding anniversary. Anyone here marry that long? 25 years? Happily married? No, let's not get into that, okay? <laughs> Who on their 25th wedding anniversary go to England to celebrate? Both a husband and wife are collectors of antiques, pottery, and very fine china. And when they come to Sussex, England, they pass this little china shop, instantaneously stop, back up, go in, and inside, as they scan the entire place, their eyes single out a little teacup on the top shelf. He looked at her. She nodded. He said, I, I, I've never seen anything before like it. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. But suddenly the teacup spoke and said, Hey, you don't understand. I haven't always been a teacup. There was time when I was just red, when I was only clay, and, and my master took me and rolled me and patted me over and over and over again. And I yelled. I yelled in objection, let me alone. But he only smiled and said, not yet. And then the teacup said, I was placed on a spinning wheel. And suddenly I spun around and around and around, and I said, stop it, stop it, I'm getting dizzy. But the master only nodded and said, not yet. Then he put me in an oven. I never felt so much heat. I wonder why he wanted to burn me up. And I yelled, I kicked at the door, and I could, I could see him in the window in the middle of the door, and I could read his lips as he slowly shook his head. Finally, finally the door opened. He put me up on the shelf and I began to cool. I said, there, that's better. And then suddenly he brushed me. He brushed me and painted me all over. And the fumes were horrible. <coughs> I mean, I thought I was going to gag. I said, stop it, stop it. But he only nodded. Not yet. Suddenly, he put me back in the oven. Not the first one but one that was twice as hot as the first. I knew I would suffocate. I begged, I pleaded, I, I screamed, I cried. And then when I knew there was no more hope and, and that I would never make it, I was ready to give up. I couldn't take it any longer. It was just too much. I was ready to give the, the whole thing up. But then the door opened, and he took me out and placed me up on the shelf. And one hour later, he handed me a mirror, and he said, look at yourself. Go ahead. Look at yourself. And I did. And I said, hey, that's not me. That couldn't be me. Whoa. I'm beautiful. I'm beautiful. Then he said, listen carefully. Listen very carefully because I want you to remember. I know it hurt to be rolled and patted. 
But if I would have left you, you would have dried up. And I know it made you dizzy to be spun around in that wheel, but if I would have stopped, you would have crumbled. And I know it hurt, and that it was hot and disagreeable in that oven, but if I had not put you there, you would have cracked. And I know the fumes were, were horrible when I painted you and brushed you over and over, but if I had not done that to you, don't you realize there never would have been any color added to your life? And if I had not put you back in that second oven twice as hot as the first, you wouldn't have survived very long. And the hardness, the strength, it wouldn't have held. But now, look at yourself. You're a finished product. A finished product. You're what I had in mind when I first began with you. You're what I had in mind when I first began with you. Some of us, maybe some of us during these past few months, maybe during the last year, year and a half, some of us have been rolled and padded, and we can't stand it. Some of us are being spun in the swirl of activities, and, and we're dizzy from life, and we object to it. Some of us are in the oven. <laughs> And it's all we can take. Others of us are being brushed and painted all over, and the fumes are getting to be just, just a little too much. And still others are in that second oven, twice as hot as the first. And we just don't think we can make it. We just don't think we can possibly survive. And through it all, through it all, we, we look to the Master for some help, some relief, some break, something for almost anything. But he just slowly shakes his head. Not yet. Not yet. May I say the author and finisher of your faith, the one who is your master and my master, according to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, the author and finisher, the perfecter of your Christian faith is Jesus Christ. And when you become a new creation, for that's how Paul describes what happens to you when, when you become a Christian. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if anyone, if anyone be in Christ, that is, if anyone gives their life to Christ, if anyone accepts Jesus as their Savior, if anyone be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, says Paul, the new has come. When you become this new creation... The primary thing that begins to happen to you is that Jesus begins to change you. He doesn't say, hey, sit over here, enjoy the family, and just, you know, and do what you want to do. He begins to change you. Oh, he accepts you as you are. You know, his unconditional love, it's there. He accepts you as you are, but the bottom line is that he doesn't leave you the way he finds you. Be so much easier if he did but he begins to change you into the kind of person, to the kind of person you were meant to be. Open, loving, noble, transparent, able to take risks, able to take that leap of faith and maybe do things. Like come up from Marker Island from Florida into Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and go to a seminary that you never heard about, Jennifer, right? To do things you never dreamed you would do before. He is the he is the author. He is the potter. We're the clay. The old life is broken and thrown in the potter field, and a new life, a new shape, a new person, a new person begins to emerge. But not only is he the author of this new creation, he's also the finisher. He's also the perfecter of this new creation. That is what he starts. He sees through to completion. He just doesn't leave you hanging. He sees through to completion, but it's not easy. It's tough. Believe me, I know. It's the toughest thing in the world. It's the toughest thing in the world because it involves being molded. It involves all those hardships that little teacup went through, and yet through it all, we have to remember that it's the master who's got the finished product in mind. And what is the finished product for you and for me? Very simply, the finished product is to be like Jesus. 
to be like Jesus because Scripture says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, verse 2, that when we see him, when we see him, we'll see that we'll be like him. Oh, you're not going to wear terry cloth bathrobes or, or have a bushy beard. Can you imagine Jennifer with a bushy beard? <laughs> That's not what it's saying about. It's, it's not a physical resemblance or likeness of Christ. Thank goodness for some of us. Okay, that's not, he's going deeper than that. We'll become like him in terms of attitude. In terms, of, Paul says, have this mind in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. We'll be like Christ in terms of attitude. We'll be like Christ in terms of perspective because we'll see people through the eyes of Jesus. We'll see situations and experiences. There are tough situations we go through, but we, we see them through the eyes of Christ. We have another perspective in our actions. We'll become like Jesus in terms of attitudes and perspective and action. But have you ever wondered? Have you ever thought to yourself, what would it be like? What would it be like if we were like Jesus right now, at this very moment, you said the Lord's Prayer this morning, didn't you? In the middle of that prayer, do you remember what it said? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? On earth, as it is in heaven. Heaven on earth. Now, when we see Jesus face to face, when we get to heaven, we'll see that we will be like him. But I have a sneaking suspicion that he doesn't want us to wait to get to heaven to be like him. He wants us to be like him right now. And have you ever asked yourself, what would it be like to be like Jesus right now? In this very moment, in this transition that you're going through as a church, what would it be like to really be like Jesus in your families, in your place of work, in your school if you go to school? What would it be like to be like Jesus in the relationships you have with the people around you. I mean, it's one thing to love those who love you. That's easy to do. To respect those who respect you. But what about those who don't love you? Who don't respect you? Who are mean-spirited? Who hurt you? What is it like to be like Jesus in that relationship? How would Jesus respond? Do you remember when he was on the cross? Those rugged nails were ripping his flesh apart. The pain was exploding. The crucifixion was horrible. The pain was exploding through his body. I mean, it was a horrible thing to go through. But more was going on. Not only the physical abuse, but, but the people who were there. The, the verbal abuse was unbelievable also. They were yelling and screaming. They are getting bigger and uglier by the man, cursing, mocking him. Hey, if you're the Son of God, come on down, man, and save yourself. Strut your stuff and show us what you can do, you Messiah, you. If you're really the Messiah, prove it. Prove it. You know, if, if he would have cursed them out of that moment, most of us, I think, would have understood. If he would have told them where to go, I think most of us, in all honesty, would say, right on, give it to them. But instead of cursing, in the middle of that, he, he screams out from left field, Father God, forgive them. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them? you got to be kidding me. That doesn't make any sense. They know what they're doing, and they're still doing it. They did not even ask for forgiveness. If someone's doing something to me that really hurts, and then they stop say, Steve, I'm sorry I messed up. Will you forgive me? It might take me a while before I forgive them. It might take me a week. It might take me a year before I forgive them. But they were still doing it to him. That didn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense to the thief on the cross. He heard what they were saying. He was going through the crucifixion himself. That didn't make any sense, he thought, unless unless he is who they say he is. And suddenly in that moment, something snapped in that thief's mind. And turning to Jesus with this new sense of awareness of who this one in the center really was, that's when with his last breath he cried out, Jesus, don't forget me. Remember me when you get into paradise. And Jesus, hearing what he said, above the noise and the ugliness of the crowd, he heard this guy and turning and seeing that he really meant it, he said in response, Today, 
you'll be with me in paradise. He cared. In the midst of the worst experience of his whole, whole life, he cared. He cared, and because he cared, it made all the difference in the world, in this world as well as the world to come for the thief on the cross, because Christ cared. That's what I call the plus element of the Christian faith. The plus element, doing the unexpected. Doing the unexpected by practicing the presence of Jesus even in the worst moment of your life. Doing the unexpected. Unbelievable. It made a difference. It made a difference doing that. How far? How far are we willing How far are we willing to go in our following of Jesus Christ? What kind of difference do we want to make? It's not easy. It's the toughest thing in the world. He did the unexpected. He did the unexpected. And it made all the difference in the world for that thief on the cross. This morning, Christ is here. He knows what you're going through. He knows how tough life can be. But He wants the best for you. And He wants the best. He wants the best for me. How far, though, are we willing to go in terms of our following of Jesus Christ. This morning, there may be a lot going on in your life, but he wants the best for you. Change is the worst thing in the world (laughs) for most of us, especially as a church, because you're not sure exactly what's going on. You're not sure where it's gonna go, but you have to remember who's in charge. You have to remember that he's never made a mistake. And he's not to begin. He's not going to begin with you because he wants the best for you. And he's going to give your very, very best. Therefore, he wants us to give him our very best in everything we do and everything we say because he's the one in charge. He's the one in charge and he'll continue to give his best for as long as we live and beyond that. How far, how far are we gonna, or willing to go in this change as we deal with situations? How far are we gonna go in terms of following Christ, even if it doesn't make any sense? He loves you, he loves you, he wants the best for you. But he wants you to give him all that you have and realize that you're never alone. You're never, ever alone. Give him your best, people. Give him your best and let the Spirit, let the Holy Spirit take care of the rest. And you won't go wrong. And what he started in you what he started in you, he's going to see through completion. Because that's how special you are. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you. We thank you that we serve a risen Savior. We thank you that he's in the world and he's in this church and he's in our hearts We thank you that even in changes, when they take place, and we're not sure exactly what direction we're going to take or how things are going to shape up, we know that you're in charge, and what you've started, you're going to see through completion. And we can depend on you fully and completely, that you're you're the one that we look to. So give us, Lord, give us strength, give us patience, and Lord, give us more faith that we might grow and become greater people as a result of our following you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for all that you've done. And thank you, Lord, for your love.
for I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.